Well, good morning and welcome to the 30th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2018. Um, would I ask everyone to turn their electrical devices to silent or off if they might interfere with the sound systems? Um, we have received apologies from committee member Angela Constance and uh, Willie Coffey is here in her stead as substitute. So I'll invite him to declare any relevant interests. Thank you, convener. Nothing other than what's already on my register. Thank you. And item two on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items five, six, and seven in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now, we take evidence today on the damages, investment, returns, and periodical payments Scotland bill. Um, and from today, the Minister for Community Safety, Ash Denham, welcome to the committee. And I will say, having sat on the economy committee, it's nice to be back. <coughs> Good. Well, we'll uh, um, see how matters unfold. I think you have an open. <laughs> I, sorry, I, I, I meant nothing uh, untoward by that. Um, I think I think you have a statement before we commence. But I'll introduce the other witnesses first, and then invite you to make your your statement. Um, then we have Jill Clark, um, Civil Law and Legal System Divis Division, Scott Matheson of the Legal Directorate, Alex Gordon of the Parliamentary Council Office, Francis McQueen, Civil Law and Legal System Division of the Scottish Government. And uh, may I say, Minister, how good it is to have you back at the uh, Economy Committee, and I'll invite you now to make your opening statement. Thank you, Convener. So thank you very much for inviting me this morning to give evidence on the damages, investment returns and periodical payments Scotland Bill. So as you will know, part one of the bill provides a changed methodology for um, setting the personal injury discount rate and allows courts to impose, in certain circumstances, very periodical payment orders. And it follows quite a lengthy period of consultation on this issue due to a range of criticisms about the current methodology. The bill is therefore intended to address some common concerns about the fairness, clarity, certainty, regularity and credibility of the method and also the process for setting the rate which emerged from the consultation on this topic. The types of personal injury cases which will be impacted by this legislation are not high in volume, but they are at the serious end of the injury scale. And so the PIDR, the personal injury discount rate, is therefore of significant importance to both pursuer and also defender interests in personal injury damages awards for future pecuniary losses. But as you have heard in the evidence sessions, both interests have very different perspectives on how best to achieve and what will deliver the 100% compensation to those that have suffered significant life-changing injuries and put them back in the position they would have been in but for the injury. And for a range of reasons, this process is not an exact science. And in fact, it is inevitably imperfect. And as you will have heard in the evidence that you've taken. And without the benefit of foresight, it can never be anything other than an approach that's intended to provide the best possible assessment for the broadest range of cases. So the policy delivered by the bill in respect of the PIDR is intended to strike a balance. It makes provision for regular reviews. It sets out a transparent and credible process which will ensure much needed certainty and also clarity in the law. <laughs> Part two relates to periodical payments, principally under periodical payments orders. And these PPOs are alternate means of paying damages for future losses to that of a lump sum. And in some cases, it may be that a pursuer has a straight choice between taking a lump sum or a PPO, but it should be stressed that it's not always the case, and the two should not be seen in that light, as has possibly been suggested in earlier evidence sessions. So I look forward to any questions that the committee has about the principles of the bill. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Minister, for that opening statement. If I might start with one or two questions. Um, you mentioned the, the uncertainties that are involved in this area, and I think that's recognised on, on all sides and by the committee indeed. Um, and it may affect the, the notional portfolio uh, and the methodology used to create that. And 
one of the one of the issues that's been raised is the question of how the notional portfolio can be representative of the needs of the hypothetical investors. I suppose notional portfolio and hypothetical investor indicate some uncertainty in the first place. Is the methodology in terms of setting out the um, notional portfolio clear enough? Okay, well, as you'll have seen, um, the bill does set out a portfolio, so it's got asset classes and percentage holdings, um, which are designed to meet the needs of um, and the characteristics of the hypothetical investor, which is laid out in the legislation, so I won't go over that now. But the hypothetical investor will have a series of objectives. So they will be properly advised, and their objective obviously will be in securing um, the investment of um, the damage, um, investment of the award to cover their damages, um, their losses, their expenses. Um, they'll obviously then make withdrawals over the period um, from the fund to cover their losses and the, also their expenses. And over the time period, those withdrawals will exhaust the fund. So the portfolio is designed to meet those very specific needs of the hypothetical investor. And it was arrived at on the basis of professional advice and expertise. So for this, GAD um, carried out detailed analysis of a number of funds that were um, categorised as low risk. Um, they were categorised that way by um, a firm called Morningstar. Um, and that's a third party um, investment research firm, which is widely recognised um, across the industry. And the notional portfolio was then built um, on the basis with reference to those funds. And so the Scottish Government believes that it would, therefore, meet the needs of an individual that's in the circumstances that we are describing. But I think um, another um, thing to, for the committee to note is that in response to the 2017 consultation, there was a small majority um, that were actually of the view that this um, idea of a mixed portfolio of assets um, was the right way to go and that actually it provides that balance between flexibility and also the best way of managing that risk. And it was also suggested by some of the people that responded to the consultation as well that they thought this also most closely matched um, the actual behaviour of um, the pursuers when they're investing. So um, I hope that, that answers the question for you. Thank you. And <clears throat> do, do you have a view on how often you'll need to use the regulation-making power to change the contents of the notional portfolio? And in fact, who, who will monitor market conditions to decide when and if that, that needs to be done? Okay. Um, the intention is obviously to review the portfolio and um, the adjustments as well, although we haven't spoken about them yet this morning, um, ahead of every time there is a regular review. So that would obviously give us the opportunity to change them if we thought that it was necessary to do that and that you know, they were not um, meeting the needs of the hypothetical investor at that time. Um, also, additionally, um, in the bill, there is the power for Scottish ministers to also call for an out-of-cycle review. So that um, gives a little bit more of a fail-safe on that. So it should always be, be matching up to the economic conditions. Um, but in terms of um, your question about... Um, you know, in terms of monitoring market conditions. We will, I think, envisage this as being um, sort of working in partnership um, with um, the, um, the government actuary on this um, so that we will both be monitoring conditions and working together so that um, we've got quite a good open communication on that matter and that way we think that um, it will constantly be up to date. And also, I mean, some have suggested that... Uh the way matters are set up in regard to the discount rate. The, so basically the, the previous assumption or current assumption that the discount rate should be calculated on a risk-free basis, moving to the assumption that it should be based on a cautious investment strategy, which may fit into what you were talking about in terms of um, safety and flexibility in, in the, the notional portfolio. Um, does the Minister have a view on whether or not this, in fact, is transferring investment risk to the pursuers, and if so, unfairly? Or is the balance met correctly, and if so, why? Mm -hmm. I did watch some of the evidence sessions, and I, I did see that that was a question that was, was raised um, in the previous ev evidence sessions. But our belief is that the portfolio in the bill is very cautious you know, for that particular reason. Um, you will also have heard evidence from the other side um, that the portfolio is equity light. Um, and overly cautious, and that's obviously according to the defender interest. So I suppose the, the government here is trying to tread a very careful line um, between, obviously, um, the interests on both sides, you know, to try and tread a, a careful, um, a very careful line through the middle and make sure that we strike the right balance here. 
Um, but the Scottish Government accepts now that it is appropriate um, to move away from the approach that was taken in Wales versus Wales, you know, from the index links guilt, or um, in order to move to this, you know, very cautious but low risk portfolio. Um, we do recognise the need, obviously, um, that you know the, the hypothetical investor will need to take professional advice on that to, t to tailor that to them. Um, but we're also obviously t making further adjustments as well. So we're making those further adjustments so that you know we reduce the risk to the investor. Um, Wells versus Wells didn't force pursuers to invest in a particular way, and nor does this legislation either. So what pursuers actually do. Um, really is irrelevant. Um, I think that will have come out in, in some of the earlier evidence that you've taken. Um, but the method is intended to provide this sort of standardised approach that will apply um, across a broad range of cases. Thank you. And now to Dean Lockhart. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Convener. Good morning to, to the Minister. got a couple of questions on the uh, adjustments to be made to the discount rate. We've heard some evidence that the 0.5% uh, adjustment for tax and investment advice uh, may not be sufficient given market uncertainties and other no unknowns in the process. I wonder if the Minister could give her views on uh, whether that 0.5% is a reasonable level of adjustment. So we sought views from GAD on this very topic um, about this appropriate level of adjustment for, for tax and also for um, investment management costs and those sort of things. And um, whilst GAD considered that um, a reasonable allowance for, for these type of things would be somewhere in the region, as you said, of 0.5, um, but it was up to 2% 2, 2 at the other end of that. It was a range. Um, they were of the view that the lower range um, of that or the lower end of that range would be likely to be um, more appropriate. And they gave a number of reasons for that, um, one of which is that they thought that um, the investors would typically shop around to get the best possible rate. Um, GAD have, um, in the GAD report, they did suggest that the Scottish Government should seek a bit uh, further advice on this issue, um, on the level of the adjustment, um, and work is being undertaken on this at the moment. So I don't know if the, um, any of my officials would like to say a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, um, I think the other reasons that um, GAD provided for um, opting for the lower end of the range was um, that it's likely that the, the portfolio we've got is qu quite full of passive funds, so they don't need you know, a lot of management for that reason, and that um, the, the shape of the market just now means that the, it, there's not pressure on higher tax charges as well, and um, that the, the fact that there's another adjustment in the bill um, also compensates on, on the way down as well. So th there was a range of reasons that they thought it was reasonable, but we are looking at it further. Thank you for that. You mentioned the further deduction. That, that's the further margin of 0.5% uh, to reduce the risk of underperformance. I wonder if I, if I could ask the Minister. We've heard evidence, and I think the Scottish Government has said itself, that there might very well be uh, overcompensation as a result of the further margin being introduced as, as an adjustment. Does the Minister accept this is a potential departure from the 100% compensation principle? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so, so, no, we don't think it is a departure, so that's the first thing to say about that. But I think also it will be clear to the committee by this point that this, you know, I've said it before, but this is not an exact science. So, um, there's always going to be um, some sort of probability of either undercompensation or overcompensation for a whole range of factors, and that's why the adjustments are there. So the adjustment, um, this particular adjustment, recognises that an investment, however cautious it is, always going to carry some sort of risk, and that obviously the methodology that we're using um, is acting as a kind of a proxy, and obviously a proxy is not able to take account of individuals' needs because you know things can vary. So that's the reason for that. So. The, this further adjustment is to improve the chances of the pursuer having you know, the exactly the right amount of, of funds to, to cover them. So um, it's worth stressing as well that when we talk about this idea of undercompensation, um, we're also talking about the likelihood or the probability of it happening, but they're not absolutes. There is risk involved with this as well, um, no matter what the award basis is. But there has been some analysis done on this. So I'll just, um, I'll just share this with the committee. So the analysis 
around the distribution of returns generated by the investment portfolio in the bill shows that if the return were not to be adjusted in the way that we're describing, it would result in a 50% chance of the pursuer being undercompensated and a 50% chance of the pursuer being overcompensated. So the question at this point is whether or not a 50% chance of undercompensation would be acceptable. And um, I would say it is not acceptable. And so that is why the further adjustment is needed in order to reduce that risk of undercompensation. Just one supplemental on that, thank you. Um, what evidence base uh, was there to support the actual figure of 0.5%? Um, that was through the analysis that, that GAD um, carried out for us in applying different margins of justice to drive down the kind of, uh, at the lower percentiles, the, the risk of over or under compensation and getting to a point that was more acceptable than the 50%. And again, did they give a range? Uh, yes, GAD? Uh, okay. and, and uh. I think we, we sent GAD's report to, to the committee and, that, and that's on the website as well. So it's laid out there uh, in a kind of tabular form. Thank you. And now Andy Whiteman. Well, thank you very much, Convener. Um, can, can you explain why the 30 years was chosen as a period over which the hypothetical investor would be investing? Um, so the investor damage profile is 30 years. Um, there's no um, kind of authority to, you know, to base that on, but it's merely chosen because it's a useful duration that's neither too short or too long. Um, and this is also remembering that this is meant to cover a broad range of cases. So there will be cases obviously at either end of the scale, and so the 30 years was, was taken as um, to be the correct amount for the damage profile. To what extent do you believe, however, this is going to impact negatively on pursuers, for example, who have a very short life expectancy? So, so it, is, it is possibly true that um, shorter awards may um, have a greater chance of, of undercompensation. So there, is, there has been some work completed on this to date. Um, and so far, it's indicating that um, you know, not more than one rate would be necessary at this time. But... Um, the bill does also provide an opportunity for the possibility of dual or multiple rates being set, perhaps in order to, to address that. Um, I wonder if the officials would like to add yes. a little bit more uh -huh. to that answer. So um, we, we asked GAD to model it on a kind of 30-year basis, on the basis that that was kind of a, uh, an average. But they, they also looked at um, 15 years and 50 years. And again, in, in 15 and 50. 15 and 50. 15 and 50. 50 okay. Sorry. And again, it's in their, their report. There, there's a sort of graph there showing the, the, the difference of the shorter duration and the longer duration. And ahead of each review, they'll do the same thing. And on their advice, if the, if the differential gets too big, that would point to their, it being more sensible to have more than one rate, you know, rate for a shorter duration and a rate for a longer duration. But it hasn't pointed in that direction at this time. So the bill leaves it open for um, more than one rate to apply in the future, should the analysis indicate that it would be better to do so, fairer to do so. The bill also, in section one, um, makes it clear that the court may take a different rate of return into account if a party to the action shows that a different rate is more appropriate in the circumstances of the case. <clears throat> I mean, I, I presume that was always intended never to bind the hand of the court. Yes, absolutely. They can look at the particular circumstances of a case and decide that the, the, the rate that was set it isn't appropriate. They can do that now. That's the existing law, and we've just retained that in, the, in this bill. It's used very rarely, but nonetheless it is there. What kind of circumstances is it used in? I think if they thought that the, the circumstances of the particular case were uh, you know, so out with the the kind of broad application that's been applied, that it would be more appropriate for another rate to be applied. So it would have to be at a kind of extreme end. OK. And in terms of, I mean, if ministers were minded to set more than one rate, what kind of circumstances um, might lead to that? And how would that apply in, in practice? So we have, let's just say we haven't come to that conclusion as yet. No, no. 
So if um, through the further evidence that we gather, it is clear that, you know, that maybe um, the shorter awards might be, um, you know, have a potential for undercompensation, then this is something that we're looking at. We're going to be getting more data from GAD, um, as Jill has said, and we'll need to look at that in detail and see how that would work. And if we think, you know, that, that um, there is a need for different rates, then, you know, that is something that we are looking at. So, so one, one factor might be different durations of life expectancy. Are there other circumstances that might lead to ministers concluding that different rates were, should be set? Generally, it's the duration of the award as opposed to um, life expectancy. And in other jurisdictions that do have more than one rate, uh, you know, they'll have a different rate for, say, 10 years or 15 years and a different rate for above that. They, they, they choose a, a duration, and they're, and they're different across jurisdictions. There doesn't seem to be any um, consistency there. But you would settle on something which, um, you know, where the differential has been created, you'd be trying to um, close that down, close that gap uh, in where you apply the two different rates. Or indeed, you could apply three rates. There's nothing to stop multiple rates being applied. But it would have to be because the actuarial advice has suggested that that's the best way to go. It would be based on that kind of analysis and evidence. Okay, I'm just wondering, if the, so, so it's basically about life expectancy and the duration of the award. There's no other circumstances such as the capacity of the injured person or their age at the time of the injury or anything else that might lead to different rates? I think generally that gets tied up in the duration of the yeah. award. Okay, because thanks. it's given for you know the the point at which they'll either improve or get better, or you know where their life will have terminated. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, if I if I might just follow up on one aspect of that, the the thirty year period. Now, the Association of British Insurers have submitted on this. I mean, their suggestion is that forty six years would be more appropriate because they say. Uh, that period is the mean duration of future damages in those cases where the discount rate is a significant factor. And they say the GAD report demonstrates clearly that if a more appropriate period of 46 years were to be applied, the probability of undercompensation decreases. And they say as such an explanation is the use of the 30-year period is required. So I'm just wondering um, if further comment could be made to answer the point about the probability of undercompensation uh, being higher if one uses a 30-year period and also um, if there's a specific methodology that was, was preferred or considered to be preferable to others in coming to that 30-year period. Okay, I'll ask my officials to give um, a more detail on that answer. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think the same, it's almost the same answer as before, you know, less or Higher or lower, 30 is a kind of average, if you like, or an appropriate level. Um, they've, apl they've applied the same um, analysis to, to each duration. We understand that they put it through their um, economic scenario generator and that that pops out the figures at the end. So that there's, there was no difference applied. It's just simply applying a different duration of award. But... Um, it is usually the case that the longer the award, um, you know, the more time someone has to recover from any dips in the market and, and get back into a better place and over a shorter award. But as I say, the, the figures that they've provided don't indicate that um, more than one rate is necessary at the moment. And so if you, that hasn't answered your question, we can... We can uh, I mean, it may be that more. you could um, give further explanation in writing yes. to the committee if that's if that might be helpful because the the 30 years you say is an average i suppose the question is an average of what and why the different factors were chosen for that but um certainly if if a further explanation writing could be provided that would be appreciated be happy to write to the committee on that with further information thank you i'll now turn to john mason a uh, thanks convener uh, building kind of on the questioning that's been going already, the, the question of political accountability and, and who makes all of these decisions. I mean, I think, uh, from what I understand, uh, the, the government yourself will be more involved in this uh, portfolio, but the actual uh, discount rates, it's much more uh, under the control of the uh, actuary and so on. That's a slightly different system from England. So how, how do we get the balance in there, or could we go one way or the other? I mean, part of me thinks, well, in this world of automation, 
couldn't we just automate the whole thing? The portfolio could be tied to the market. The discount rates could all be tied by formulas and we would have no political involvement, which sounds quite good. But on the other hand, some people would like to put you up in the chamber and then we can all ask you questions and shoot at you and these things. So how do we get the balance in there? OK, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, it's a very fair question. So, I mean, there has been... Um a little bit of comparative work done on this with a view to looking at other countries and to see how they, how they do things. Um, and there is a huge variety across different juris jurisdictions and how, how they approach that. So um, in some, um, it's a legislator. In some, it's the judiciary. In some, it's a hybrid involving both in different, um, in different amounts. So obviously, this, this is the decision where the, the, the policy choices co come into effect. And so um, we've taken the, the policy decision to place the duty to um, review the discount rates onto the government actuary, um, because we think that is consistent with the overall policy of reforming the law in this way, so that the method and the process are clear, um, certain, fair and transparent as well. So I think it's important as well to mention at this point that um, the 2017 consultation responses, um, as part of those, they actually, there was there more support for options um, that didn't involve ministers. So it does seem to be fairly consistent with what the, the, um, the consultation responses were. And I think the Scottish Government view in this case is that with regard to determining the rate, it is purely an actuarial exercise. There is no need in that case to exercise political judgment. Um, and so the decision has been taken to obviously give it to a suitably qualified um, and credible professional. And then what that will, will give us at that point is that the government actuary obviously has been selected because of their expertise and standing in this area. They'll obviously publish their reasoning along with the rate and that will allow a complete transparency of the process. So we think that that's the right approach in this case. Um, would Jill like to add anything further to that? Um, Probably not. No. Really. <laughs> okay. So my follow-up on that one, then. I mean, I, I'm broadly persuaded by your argument on the rate. Is why would that not be the case also for the portfolio? Because the suggestion has been made that a obviously we've got a nice government at the moment, but in the future we might not have such a nice government, and the they might manipulate the portfolio. Okay. I think I think that is a fair point, and, that, that, and that's why I think with the rate. You know, it is really good to have it removed from the political arena, which is not the case in England and Wales, as I'm sure the committee um, are, are aware. And taking it away from the, you know, people that would seek to influence or, you know, ministers being under pressure in that way is really good. I think in terms of the methodology for the portfolio, um, that is something that I think needed to be developed over a longer time. It needs more analysis. But, but both um, but the portfolio is able to be reviewed by um, government ministers um, in order to make sure that it you know, it, um, it is matching up to economic conditions as well. And that will be subject to scrutiny by Parliament as well. So we think that that, you know, adds um, an extra level of, um, I think, credibility to the process and also transparency as well. Yeah, I was going to say that the, the constant in the bill is the description of the hypothetical investor. Mm -hmm. And the portfolio can only be... Um, changed in line with the hypothetical investor. So somebody couldn't come along and suddenly make it a very risky portfolio because that wouldn't meet the needs of a hypothetical investor. So that's the kind of grounding part of the bill. And the, the powers to change the portfolio and the adjustments are meant simply to keep them up to date and, and relevant as investment markets change. But the constant is the descriptor of the hypothetical investor, which would have been agreed um, by the parliament. Okay, thanks. Now, you've indi sorry. Did you want to, some Mr. Matheson, was it Mr. Gordon? Sorry, oh, it's just just on a technical basis, just part of the navigation around the bill. I mean, the minister and the government has put all these figures before you. So ultimately, if the bill is passed, um, eventually, Parliament will have endorsed the figures at the outset. But even if ministers were to come forward with regulations to change any of this, the 30 years or the figures in the notional portfolio or the figures in the standard adjustments, all those regulations are subject to the affirmative procedure. So although ministers would be bringing it forward, it would need parliamentary endorsement, any of these changes. That's helpful. Thanks very much. Now, you have said, Minister, that, uh, that we could end up with a different system. Well, we're obviously going to have a different system from Scotland and England. I mean, is that a problem? Does that cause any concern? Because clearly some of the insurers, for example, are uh, 
operating throughout the UK, if not beyond. Mm -hmm. I, d I don't have any practical concerns about this. Um, obviously, we did consult jointly with the Minist uh, Ministry of Justice on setting the PIDR. Um, but obviously, you know, the Lord Chancellor is responsible for setting it in England and Scottish ministers are responsible for setting it in Scotland. So I think it was appropriate that um, we took this work forward separately um, in that case. So it may or it may not result in different rates being set north and south of the border. Um, we don't know at this time how insurers may react to that in terms of setting their premiums. But I think um, an important point to note on that is that the number of the types of these catastrophic high value cases will be really quite low. Um, and I think it will be quite small in relation to, you know, overall the insurance business. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add any more into that answer. No. Uh, and then to move, to move on from that one, um, I mean, obviously the insurers uh, are one of the uh, categories of defenders in these cases, but the NHS is another. Now, a lot of us are probably sympathetic to the idea that we should be a bit more generous to the injured party, but the reality is that that would then have an impact on the NHS. Um, and presumably if the NHS is paying out slightly more uh, than elsewhere, uh, we have to find that from the NHS budget. Uh, and so, again, I'm just wondering, are we getting the balance right? Uh, is, is there a problem for the NHS budget going forward? Um, I think that is a good question, but I think... Um, because of these changes, um, the higher PIDR rate um, means that if the same exercise were carried out simultaneously under the current methodology, um, by reference to the, go the government gills, um, this one is going to produce awards that are on average closer to the 100% compensation. Um, and so, um, with regard to the present system, this should result in less overcompensation. So the cost of defenders, and you mentioned particularly the NHS, and obviously that is you know, a major factor, um, the cost of the NHS in that case should be less in terms of the awards that um, they're being required to make. And obviously you um, will have heard from the NHS and from other stakeholders as well that um, it's important to them, um, this facility to um, continue settling um, future losses by way of the PPOs, and that they were they were supportive of that. So I think they're welcoming the changes in the bill um, accordingly. So just to clarify, when you said it would be less for the NHS, less than the NHS is currently perhaps paying, but perhaps more than the equivalent it would be in England? Um, I mean, at this time, we, we don't know, because out. we simply don't know what the discount rate is going to be in England and Wales, and we, we won't know till the end of their review, um, because that, that's when that happens. So okay. it's difficult to, to say... Okay, but fair enough. We obviously will keep it under review. <coughs> um, I, I suppose uh, whether or not we have a nice government at the minute may depend uh, as to who you ask and uh, which government the deputy convener was referring to, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll put that to one side. Um, may, I, may I just clarify on one point, though? I think, as you said, Minister, quite rightly, there are different approaches could be taken to this. Is the intention of the government to effectively have independent decision making by having the UK government actuary dealing with this one particular issue to take political influence out Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. So that it particular. will be independent of, of, of political interference. It will be independent of ministers, and it will be a, a fully transparent process. Yes. Right. Thank you. Now, Andy Whiteman had a brief follow up, and then I think to Gordon Macdonald after that. Yes. Just thanks. Following um, John Mason's uh, line of question, I just want. To clarify, maybe I've missed something here, but the, the government actuary will be responsible for setting the, the rate, what well, ministers ultimately, but the government actuary will be the, the professional advisor in that regard. But in terms of any potential changes to the portfolio, there's no provisions in the bill about what advice ministers will take in that regard. That's a role given exclusively to ministers. Um, do, you not take, do you not think that there might be a role for the government actuary in that as well? Or am I reading it? The no, there wrongly. will be, because we and um, the government would take advice from them on that. But, but no statutory provision, as far as I can see, for taking advice, or am I wrong? No. Um, there's no statutory provision to that effect, but there's no statutory provision in many areas where the government does, as a matter of course, take advice, appropriate uh, professional advice in a, in a range of circumstances. I was wondering, though, because the bill does make it clear that the government actuary, unless the government appoints somebody else, is responsible for setting the rate, makes that clear, but it doesn't make clear what role any other party like the government actually would play in potential changes to the portfolio? The 
the, the function when it comes to the actual determination of the rate is a function that is conferred upon the government actuary. There is there's provision in the, in the bill to allow, by regulations, the Scottish ministers to, to change that in due course if, if uh, it was necessary to, for somebody else to, to do that. But at that stage, the government actuary's role is, is indeed one of decision-making, but decision-making within a very narrow range of uh, parameters which are set out in the legislation. So the government actuary at that stage is not acting as an advisor to ministers where the ministers determine the rate. The government actually will be uh, determining the rate, producing a report, and it is the, the rate as set out in that report which would uh, which will be the, the rate uh, that the, the courts are to take into account subject to the, discre the discretion that's been referred to earlier. Right, so the statutory provisions are, are there because the actuary is a decision maker, and that has to be made clear, uh, but, there, but there's no statutory rule for the government actuary or anybody else in advising ministers on the makeup of the portfolio. So my question is, should there be, or should that be left totally to the discretion of ministers? With parliamentary oversight? Well, well of course. I mean, all these will be subject to regulation-making mm -hmm. powers in Parliament. Yeah. But to be clear, when an affirmative procedure comes forward with something like this, there's a huge depth behind that. One can't expect Parliament to drill down on that. And to, to assist Parliament in that job, um, I'm just suggesting that there might be merit in making statutory provisions for advice, such that advice can be interrogated in exactly the same way as the GAD report can be interrogated by interested parties at the moment. I think I would come back to the point that Jill Clark made earlier, that because in the legislation it has to take into account the interests of the hypothetical investor, any changes to um, the, the makeup of the portfolio are going to, to bear that in mind, and then it's going to be further scrutinised by the Parliament. So I'm fairly comfortable with this, uh, you know, as it as it sits. Anybody want to add anything more to that? No. Right. I, I think Jamie Halco Johnson had another brief follow-up on this point, and then we'll move to Gordon Macdonald. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's just a very very quick one. Um, in the uh, financial um, memorandum, uh, paragraph 43, it says a 0.25 percent difference could add 2.5, sorry, two to five million to the cost of claims against public bodies in Scotland. One of the uh, in South Lanarkshire Council submission to the Finance Committee, um, they they basically suggested that they would expect the Scottish Government to cover any fluctuations in cost in terms of either claims against public bodies or. Um, uh, uh, or, or kind of increases in um, their premiums. Is that something the government has looked at, is ready to do? Um, we are keeping this um, under review, but I'll, I'll ask uh, my official to give you a little bit more detail on that. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's the, the, the same as the Minister said earlier. We expect the, relatively speaking, we expect the discount rate to increase under this um, um, method, so therefore costs to defenders should decrease. But, of course, we'll keep the matter under review. Yeah. Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Kintina. In, in terms of the discount rate review period, um, during previous evidence sessions, it's been suggested by some that five or even seven years would be a more suitable review period for the discount rate. What's the justification for the bill having a review period of three years? Um, that is a good question. Um, I think the... The, the legislation in general was meant to make sure that we don't get into the situation that we've had before where there was very long periods between reviews. And so um, the, it was considered that this period, this three-year period, um, would be a suitable compromise you know, uh, um, across that. Um, the government is certainly opening to consider alternative periods. Maybe that would be a five-year period. Um, if that would be more acceptable. So I'd be interested in the, in the committee's views on this in the stage one report, if that is something that the, the committee um, is considering. Okay, uh, I mean, we also heard that in some personal injury cases, it can take several years to settle it, and that there is a concern by some that, um, you know, parties involved, either party involved in the case, could try to either delay or speed up settlement to take advantage of what the rate change is going to be if they know in advance what that rate change is going to be. So is there any safeguards that can be put in place um, within this bill to try and minimise this? 
So I would say that the three-year the three year period, for that very reason that you've just outlined, would, would seem to me to strike that balance. Because if it was, was happening every three years routinely, um, I think um, this sort of gaming the system type approach um, possibly wouldn't occur. I think the other thing to point out as well is that even though a regular review is being carried out every, let's say, is every three years, it wouldn't necessarily lead to a change in the rate every time. So, um, so we have to sort of con consider that as well. Um, also, um, the Scottish Government, um, or it's written into the bill that ministers would have um, the opportunity to carry out an interim review. So if it was necessary at any point, let's say economic circumstances changed drastically um, and, you know, suddenly the rate wasn't appropriate, um, uh, you know, that, that, would, that would also be a possibility to, to keep it up to date. Um, so... I would be interested to hear what the committee's views on that. We uh, we have thought that the three-year period would be appropriate, but I would be interested to hear um, other views on that. Okay, thanks so much. And Colin Beatty. Minister, um, previous sessions we've had, there's been quite a discussion about PPOs and uh, the impact of them. Do you think that the provisions in the bill are sufficient to in increase the actual use of PPOs in Scotland? And... Does the government have any other plans to encourage their use? Um, the number of cases I think that have got the potential to, to have a, a PPO are really quite small to begin with. So I don't think we're anticipating um, a large increase in, in the numbers of, of take-up. But I suppose what we are hoping that providing courts with the option to encourage um, people to use them where they're appropriate would obviously might increase slightly. And also, we think this might have an influencing effect. So um, on cases where they don't go to court, but they're actually um, maybe being settled by agreement, um, even though they're not being forced by a court order to um, use a PPO, they might consider to do one anyway. So um, we do know they're not suitable in every case. So they, they won't be suitable for all pursuers. We know that, um, you know, for a variety of factors, some pursuers um, may prefer to have a, a clean break. You know, they, they won't want to enter into this. And also, um, not all d defenders are going to be um, sufficiently um, financially secure um, to undertake them as well. But we, we do hope that we, there will be a higher use of them, regardless. It to indicate that uh, pretty much 100% of uh, PPOs currently uh, are through the NHS and virtually nothing elsewise. Do you see that changing? Do you want to add any detail? I think marginally that it might, you know, people might be more encouraged to use them, but the numbers are not, as the Minister said, very high in, in the first place. And the NHS is the predominant user of them. Numbers are not high, but of course the actual value is, is very much higher, significantly so. Yes. Um, last week's evidence session, the committee noted that the, the bill's provisions on reasonable security don't appear to cover the Motor Insurers Bureau. Is that, was that a deliberate omission? And if so, what was the thinking behind it? Um, so the provisions of the bill do allow um, Scottish ministers to add additional bodies to the list. So I think that would be the process for adding, um, as you say, the Motor Insurance Bureau to that list, because I know that that is an issue that's been, been raised by a number of the consultees um, during this process. Um, there was a little bit of con concern around Brexit um, in relation to this, um, particularly the timing um, and the fact that it would co coincide with the later stages of um, this bill's parliamentary passage. So um, it was decided that, um, including a power for Scottish ministers, to add or to remove, but in this case probably to add MIB to the list, seemed um, like the most uh, appropriate way to, um, or the most sensible option in this case. Are you saying the government is going to consider it or the government will do it, adding them to the list? We're considering it at this point. Yeah, I think we're just going to wait and see because the, the, the courts found them to be a secure provider, MIB, but it was because under Article 4 of the second European Directive on Motor Insurance that that's kind of contributed to the courts thinking that they were a secure provider. So we just want to see what would replace that in a Brexit world. And once we were... Um, confident about that, um, MIB could be added to, to the list. Okay. It's just a lack of clarity just now. If that if that's no longer in place, what would replace it? And it would be something that the UK government would be putting in place. So we'd have to wait for the UK government to give some sort of indication on this? 
Yes. So at the moment you could not add them on the basis of uh, where, you, where uh, you're situated at the moment? I think because one of the factors that contribute to them being thought of as reasonably secure by the courts is about to, to change. So we just think it would be a bit premature. The, the provisions of the bill about reasonable security set up an assumption for the court. Um, so that's the idea there being it allows the, the courts to proceed on the basis that uh, that, that defender or that, that payer um, is going to have sufficient financial backing during the course of an award to ensure that the, the, the PPO payments themselves are sufficiently backed. Setting up an assumption doesn't exclude the possibility that somebody who's not, or a defender which is not on that list in the statute could, could persuade the court uh, that they have sufficient financial, financial backing. So by, by them not being in those provisions at the moment doesn't prevent them in particular cases uh, making the case to the, to the court that they should be uh, taken as being uh, reasonably secure. So okay. That's what the Insurance Bureau do at the moment. They have to convince the court on a case-by-case -case basis, but normally the court finds that they are secure. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, the committee's heard evidence that the risk of satellite litigation would be reduced um, if the wording on the bill around seeking a variation of a PPO mirrored existing legislation. Is that something the government's considering? Um, we have looked at this um, and we don't think that the model in the 1982 Act is an appropriate fit here, but I'll, I'll let the officials just give you a bit more clarity around that. Um, that one? Again? Alec. <laughs> just again on a technical basis, and I hope I'm answering the right question, so if you, if you, if you let me try. Um, just as a drafting technician, um, I find it very useful to look at other legislation by way of example, but I'm also very wary of picking up something as a precedent that might not be the best fit for the particular context that we're dealing with. So I'm always open-minded to how one might go about things, and there's always more than one way to go about anything. Um, so among us in government, we choose our approaches very carefully in a particular context, like here. Now, the gateway to variation and how variation applies once you're, you're through that gateway is the court must be satisfied that there's a chance of change in the pursuer's uh, condition at some point in the future, and then secondly, should that change occur, there would be either over or under compensation. Now, we at the moment do not weigh the amount of change required in the condition or how the, what, what actual chance it is. That just gets you into the real root of this. Is there likely to be significant under or over compensation? And that's the root of the issue. So perhaps you don't need to measure the amount of risk of change or how much change that will be, because I think it would be unlikely to have significant over under compensation if there wasn't any change or any meaningful change in someone's condition. So while you could on a different day try to calibrate that differently, I think the way the provisions, well, I hope, um, can I help put them on the page, um, if we go straight to the root of the problem, namely the issue of significant under over compensation, and you don't know if you need to cutter that with some other uh, qualifier in the, the first part of that twofold test. The, the main bit of the twofold test is the second bit of it. Okay. Still on the question of uh, um, pursuers returning to court to request a variation of a PPO, there's been concerns raised about the costs of that. Um, perhaps the Minister could consider whether she could commit to ensuring these costs fall on defenders, which would be a, a fairer approach, I think. Um, I think that that is an interesting point that you've raised there, um, and it does. I mean, it does raise some questions about um, quarks, um, about provisions in the Civil Litigation Act, which has obviously been uh, recently endorsed by the Justice Committee and also um, the wider chamber. But I think at the moment um, we we need to look at um, the interaction of that bill, um, or sorry, of this bill and also the Civil Litigation Act to just. Um, I think we need to consider this further, and um, we would be happy to, to write to the committee with some further information on that. No, that would be interesting, because certainly, although we have no feel for how much it would cost for a pursuer to come back for a variation, uh, indications from some of the witnesses were it could be quite substantial. 
So there's a question of fairness in this. Yeah, we'll be happy to um, give this a little bit more thought and write back to the committee with our thoughts on that. Good. Um, Willie Coffey. Convener, uh, good morning, Minister. Just as the, the new boy in this committee, I wonder if I could ask a slightly less technical question. I've been very impressed with my colleagues' rigour in examining the, the issue in front of us. Uh, you said uh, in your opening remarks that one of the, the intention was to try to put people back in the position they would have been as far as possible before serious injuries took place. Are you confident that the, that the bill will deliver in, on that objective and are you confident and, and satisfied that there are sufficient scrutiny opportunities for the Parliament and the committees to, to examine this as we go forward? Um, we are. Obviously this bill, um, this is a bill that um, has been requested. Um, this is a bill that has um, been, or the, the principles of the bill have been um, subject to consultation, um, not once but three times. So there's a, um, a quite a desire for a change in the law. Um, but obviously, um, you know, there was not consensus exactly on um, some of the, um, the policy choices. But the government has been very careful to um, choose a course of action that was intended to, to strike the appropriate balance between the pursuer and the defender interests and to make um, the, both the method, method and the process um, for setting the rate um, as clear and transparent and um, um, with an ability to be scrutinised by the Parliament, as you rightly say, as possible. And um, I am very comfortable that it does those things. Thank you. Any further questions from committee members? Andy Whiteman. Uh, Jill Clark, in a previous comment, you, you said that you expect the discount rate to increase as a result of this bill. Um, can you explain why? Well, I said relative, relative to what exists at the moment, because, um, you know, investment markets have changed since 2017 when, when the current rate was set, but the, the portfolio is um, of a higher risk than the um, ILGS investment, so it should follow that the discount rate will be slightly higher. If you were taking an even playing field and running both um, analysis at the same time. So the, the moment that there is overcompensation? Under ILGS, yes. Yep. Um, the probability of overcompensation under ILGS is quite significantly high, yes. Okay, just to get that clarity for the record, thanks. Right. Um, Jamie Halker Johnson. Can I just ask a very quick question and maybe I could clarify the Civil Litigation Act um, passed earlier this year, earlier this year capped um, payments at 2.5 per cent for no no win no fee I think um, that uh, but that that was overturned I think there was an amendment by the Scottish government that allowed that to continue with these with these um, these one-off payments um, but that doesn't apply to PPO settlements so how do you think that impacts on decisions made by pursuing solicitors to perhaps discourage their clients away from PPO payments yeah, so PPO settlements I'll ask my officials to give you some more detail on that it's quite uh, quite difficult to speak for the entire legal profession and I don't feel that as a, an advisor to the, the Scottish Government I can can really do so. Um, the, uh, I believe there are practices that are uh, put in place by uh, at least some firms to ensure that independent actuarial advice uh, has been taken and given to the, uh, to the, the, the person who will be the, the recipient of the, the damages uh, and to ensure that they are um, that the, the decisions on whether or not to take a PPO settlement or a pe periodical payment settlement rather than uh, a, a lump sum awards are taken on the basis of uh, actuarial advice um, and that the steps can be taken to, to ensure that um, that is advice independently given to the, to the recipient of the damages rather than it being filtered through the solicitor's concern to ensure, um, to ensure that is, uh, to, to ensure that the, the independence of that advice um, and, and it isn't skewing or being skewed by the interest of the solicitor's concern. Um, but that, that's by way of an example rather than stating that as a, a universal practice. Is, 
be a, a brave man or woman that claimed to speak for the entire Scottish legal profession, indeed. Um, thank you very much, Minister, for coming in today, and I'll now suspend this uh, meeting for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Well, welcome back to uh, this morning's meeting of the committee. We now turn to look at the Common Financial Tool Scotland Regulations 2018, and we have uh, as our panel of witnesses for this part of this morning's proceedings, uh, first of all, Alan McIntosh, Senior Money Advisor from Inverclyde Council, um, Angela Kazmierczyk, Financial Inclusion Team Leader of Aberdeen City Council, Nicola Burrell, Senior Money Advisor, Money Advice and Rights Team East Renfrewshire Council, and last but not least, Scott Milne, Director of WRI Associates. So welcome to all four of you. Thank you for coming in today. Um, you don't need to press any buttons. That will all be done by the sound desk. So if you want to come into the discussion and you're not getting in, just indicate by raising your hand and I will um, ensure that you can come in. And don't feel obliged to respond to every question um, we'll just see how the, the discussion and questions develops. So I'll turn, first of all, to John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener. And, uh, well, there'll be a range of questions, but to start off, uh, one of the arguments for the adoption of the standard financial statement uh, has been that it would standardise procedures right across the UK. And I think the argument is that, well, a lot of uh, creditors are, are UK organisations or wider. Uh, how important it is, is it that we have a, a standard, the same thing, right across the UK? Because I think it was Mr McIntosh and his evidence made the point that debt has never been treated the same way or in between Scotland and England. So how do we balance these off? Um, well, if I can start, uh, you're, you're absolutely correct. There's never been, to use a phrase that's quite common these days, a single market in terms of debt recovery in, in the UK. Scotland's obviously always had its own distinct legal system. Um, we've had our own debt solutions, we've had our own debt recovery laws. And creditors who work in the, operate in the Scottish market, and pretty much they all do, uh, except that when, you know, in the Scottish market, you know, if somebody's in debt, then there's separate legal procedures and debt recovery procedures that have to be used. They also accept there's separate debt solutions, like, for example, uh, the debt arrangement scheme. Uh, there is no comparison anywhere else in the UK, although you'll probably have learned from the last budget, the UK government is now looking to introduce and learn from the Scottish government scheme and introduce a similar scheme in the, UK, the rest of the UK. So I, I don't think there's necessarily a need, as per se, for a standardised financial statement across the UK. I don't object to there being a standardised financial statement either. Uh, I think the, the important thing is, is whatever solution it is, it has to be the correct solution for Scotland and it has to be the correct solution for our system. I say there's no objection in principle to be a UK, uh, UK uh, standardised financial statement. I accept that it's got benefits for creditors, and if that's possible, then I don't see why we would object to it. I accept it's got benefits for large organisations, national organisations like Step Change. Uh, they can then operate one system, one computerised system across the UK. So basically, my, my opinion is there's no need for it. Uh, it's got some benefits, but the important thing is, is that it's an appropriate solution for Scottish consumers and it provides uh, fair uh, outcomes for both the consumers and the creditors. Anyone else wanted to come in? Yes. Ms. If I could just add to that, um, previously what we did have in Scotland um, by practice was we had one model that was being used with creditors and one model that was being used specifically for insolvency. So before we had the common financial tool, there was commonly two sets of trigger figures being used in Scotland for different debt solutions. That was an issue, but I don't think across the UK it's a big an issue, especially like Alan says, for people that are doing local debt advice that are working only with Scottish clients. I would add as well that um, the FCA Consumer Credit Source Book, which covers how debt collection practices should be done, still does have a reference to say that creditors should be using the common financial statement, which is what our CFT is based on, or the equivalent. So we are still covered in terms of the creditors are instructed to use the Common Financial Statement or the SFS, so there's no real need for one tool. I mean, there seemed to be an argument that uh, some creditors were not signed up to the Common Financial Statement and that it was more likely they would stand up, uh, sign up to the, uh, the standard uh, financial statement. Are you saying that's not the case? I'm not clear. I don't know if you've had um, representations on specifically which creditors are going to sign up to SFS. I know there was a suggestion at the start that um, public sector creditors would buy into that. However, we haven't seen any evidence of that. And also, I think it's highly unlikely, given the fact that if you have somebody who's on job seekers allowance, who's over 25, they'll get about £317 a month. 
that's less than the housekeeping trigger figure for both tools. So we could fairly turn around to a public sector creditor and say this person has no disposable income by virtue of the fact they're on benefits. A public sector creditor is not going to take either a token payment or a period of non-payment. They're going to go straight in and try and deduct money. So I don't see, although they've said it well, I think at the last evidence session they talked about the insolvency service. They didn't talk about HMRC or DWP um, or local authorities collecting debts, and they're the ones that we, I would say, we struggle with. Just to clarify at the moment, uh, a, if, it, if it's a Scottish public authority like a local authority, um, are they signed up to the common financial statement at the moment? They're not. It's on a case-by-case -case basis around local authorities. There's no national agreement. So we have agreements with some departments that we work closely with that they will use that and they will sign up to that. But that is on a case-by-case -case basis. There's no national agreement on that. Okay, thanks. Did other others want to come in? Yes. Yeah, no, um, obviously local authorities, HMRC and DWP, it's only if it's a statutory debt option they then have to comply with the common financial statement. Um, but I would concur with both um, Nicola and Alan there. You know, it, most people that we see that have local authority debts or DWP, it's, it's people that are claiming benefits and they would get nowhere near the, the trigger figures um, because th their income is just not high enough. Um, so they don't use the, the common financial tool when we're looking at doing just a council tax arrangement or a, a rent arrears arrangement because they would be paying nothing towards that debt where the expectation is they should be paying something towards it. So the, the kind of statement they are saying that this would help um, government agencies that are collecting debt, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Okay. Mr Milne, did you want to come in as well? Um, I I intend to deal mostly with this after the event, effectively, um, and as part of the actual formal insolvency process. So I don't have generally any engagement with creditors prior to that point in, in the same way as, uh, as Nicola, Angela and Alan will do. Okay. And then the, my other point would be, um, I mean, if we, it, is it practical? And if we did carry on with the common financial statement rather than switching, uh, would that have an impact on creditors? I, sp I suppose if, 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 all, if all creditors across the UK start using the standard financial statement, then obviously, I don't know if it would have an impact, it would just continue the way it's currently used. And in terms of this, the common financial statement or the common financial tool, they would continue to use the common financial tool the way they're currently doing. They're legally obliged to accept it in terms of statute of debt remedies. Uh, so. I don't know what, uh, you know, obviously they would, they would prefer probably to have the same standard financial statement across, you know, or stand, same common financial statement across the UK, I accept that, but in terms of how, what would happen in reality, it would just continue. I, I would say, that I think there's also a, a point that I would like to emphasise is, is that even if we do have a standard financial statement across the UK, it's not going to be uniform because in Scotland, obviously, we have certain additional layers of guidance uh, in the way it's implemented, which I think is crucial. So I think even a standard financial statement across the UK will never be uniform because it will always, the, the key difference is, is how it's implemented in Scotland. And I think that's where money advisors have really struggled in the last three years. A regulatory perspective, the Financial Conduct Authority again gives um, instruction to creditors they must be mindful of the legal differences in terms of the different debt solutions in Scotland. So there's no reason why they can't have a similar thing to say you must have regard to the differences when we do a financial statement. Okay, well, I think colleagues will follow up on some of these. Thanks very much. Yes, um, perhaps I could just clarify something with uh, Alan McIntosh. I mean, um, in, in your sub written submission to the committee, you talked about the what you've also mentioned here today about the differences between the, the Scottish and English legal position. Um, and I think you've just touched on this perhaps where you, you said in your um, position paper that uh, even if Scotland adopted the standard financial statement, it would not result in a common approach being adopted across the UK as the Scottish approach is distinct. Uh, an additional layer of guidance is applied to it by the AIB over and above that which is applied elsewhere in the UK by the governing body of the SFS. So are you saying that effectively, even if we adopted the SFS in Scotland, there would still be um, an additional layer of guidance from the AIB uh, to take account of the different Scottish position? Um, do you think that would be a, will be a good thing or a bad thing if it's brought in? Well, if I can maybe get, just explain uh, the background slightly, it'll be taken very quickly. 
I've used the Common Financial Statement in the UK since 2000, or in Scotland uh, since 2003. So prior to the, it being adopted as this Common Financial Tool, and I supported the adoption of a Common Financial Tool, I still support the adoption of a, uh, the continuation of the Common Financial Tool. And in 2015, I supported the adoption of the Common Financial Statement as that Common Financial Tool because it worked well, it was flexible. It, Creditors accepted things quite easily. It was common sense, and it did generally provide, in my experience, uh, good outcomes for the clients and the creditors. What we did not take into consideration, when we, in hindsight, the benefit of hindsight, uh, is you know we didn't what we didn't take into consideration in 2015 was how the character of the common financial statement was going to change in 2015 when it came in, and it was because obviously this additional layer of guidance that's been brought in uh, because of the evidential requirements uh, and the verification that we have to obviously to meet, and obviously that's one of your big concerns, and I think it's one of the concerns why when the common financial uh, tool consultation was carried out, I believe last year, the, the accounting bankruptcy there was over 70 responses. The majority of the agencies that, uh, that responded did not want to see a common financial, the standard financial statement uh, being brought in because there was a fear that this is just going to exacerbate the situation. And obviously, one of our primary concerns at the moment, I would say, is that we still don't have, as these regulations are being proposed, we still don't have the state the same, the, the finalised version of the guidance for the standard financial statement. And to me, that's. Uh, Basically, forgetting the lessons of the past, what, which is what happened in 2015, we got the regulations, then we got the guidance. And this time round, I would rather see the guidance uh, being brought forward and finalised at the time that the, this committee obviously makes a decision on these regulations. Mm. So, in, in effect, you're saying that you would like to see before a decision is taken on these regulations? Yeah, I've got a draft version here, but yeah, I would like right. to see the finalised version. Uh, I believe at the last Common Financial Tool Working Group, the decision was taken if these regulations go through, they'll create a subgroup in December to look at them because David Hilford had asked at the last Common Financial Tool Working Group that we had to go through this guidance line by line and make sure it was going to, how it was going to work when the standard financial tool was implemented. And I believe the decision was taken, we'll do that after if the regulations go through. I believe that has to be done. You know, that, that should be done at the same time, because I believe it's really important. Uh, some of the issues in, that are raised by this guidance, and I can explain, give more evidence than that if the committee wants, but some of the issues that really that, uh, arise at this guidance, they, they are basically they, they're the meat on the bones, and it's really that that I believe this, this committee really needs to see, because there's things about child maintenance, there's about things about verification, and maybe some of my colleagues could maybe expand a bit further on that as well, because I think that's really the... We won't have time to go in and yeah, in evidence that. here today, but certainly if you feel there's something additional that you could write into the committee to, to illustrate and you know um, add to that point, um, that, that, that would be helpful. Uh, I see Angela was nodding in agreement. I don't know if Scott Milne has any comment on that that he can make at this stage. Um, again, it's my role is generally after, during an insolvency appointment, a formal insolvency appointment, or thereafter. Um, I don't have the same involvement as these guys will have um, in terms of the, the, the creditor engagement, potentially. And what I am then looking at is presenting creditors with effectively a, a, a package fait accompli. Uh, so the, the, there's, there's less scope, I suspect, for, my, um, you know, for me to, to have a great amount of input to that. Right, thank you. We'll move on to questions from Colin Beattie now. I'd like to look at uh, a little bit about the, uh, the breaches of trigger figures and uh, the impact, the administrative impact on uh, advisors. You know, various people giving evidence have commented on this, and I'd be interested in, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of explanation as to how that would impact on yourselves. Um, I think the first thing to remember is that a breach of trigger figures isn't something that always has to be justified. So the financial statement, I think David made this point, um, David Hilfert made this point before, it's not just a way we get someone into a solution, it should be a budgeting tool. So that should be um, something that stays with them and they work towards. So it's an ongoing conversation between the advisor and the client. So we'll draw up an income and expenditure and if we see that there's a breach in trigger figures, we then need to have a discussion with that person about why there's a breach. That's already made quite difficult because we can't tell them how much they've breached by <laughs> or what the figure is they're aiming to get towards because we're not allowed to tell them the figure. Um, and given the fact that most of the money advice process is built on trust, it's a very intrusive process, we're asking them to give us a lot of details about their life and their household. That's very difficult. Um, 
But if it is something where there isn't what we would consider to be a reasonable explanation in the view of the creditors or the AIB, we need to then work with that client to get that breach down. So that's the first piece of administrative work we might need to do. That could be comparison sites, that could be assisting um, to complete discount forms. Um, it could be doing a spending diary exercise with the client to try and get them to reduce what they're spending, advising them about cheaper places to buy food, all of that sort of stuff. If it's a reasonable breach, um, which would be generally the ones that we tend to see are where there's a disability in the house, someone has a particular dietary need. Um, there's The other one would be where someone has like joint care of a child, but they, they don't have the allowance for the child within their budget because they don't have full care of that child. Then we then have to try and evidence, one, what is the breach, and show that they definitely are overspending that breach, but also to provide evidence for the cause of that breach. Um, and again, as I say, that's not always an easy discussion to have with someone who's already potentially at their lowest point and you're saying to them, no, you need to go and get me evidence that you spend that much on petrol and we need to write a reason about what your health conditions are and the reasons that you need to spend more than that or because they live rurally or because of the job that they have, whatever the reason might be. We need to have sufficient evidence for that and we need to explain to the client that that's not because of our mistrust, that's because later on down the line we are going to be asked to provide that. It's, from what you're saying, it sounds like quite a lot of work, potentially, yeah. in each case. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any quantification as to the cost of that, the notional cost? No, I couldn't give you a notional cost. Um, it's not something, done for, fortunately, maybe it's not something local authorities really measure. I don't know if the other guys have done any exercises. Um, I think another thing to mention, you're speaking about um, getting evidence for trigger figure breaches. If we then adopt the standard financial statement, there's more evidence that we need to gather to evidence that the fixed costs under the, the common financial statement, it's just essential expenditure, which is usually fairly easy to evidence, such as your rent, council tax, um, gas, electric, TV licence. Um, and but under the standard financial statement, it shifts more of these um, expenditure into those fixed costs, um, which we'll then need to evidence, which that then brings in travel costs where before, as, as long as they were within the, the trigger figures amount, we could just accept them and just move on. So it's not even just in the, the, the breaches of the trigger figures that we'll need to get evidence. We'll need to get evidence for more things if we adopt the standard financial statement. At the moment, if we just write up to a creditor for just a voluntary payment plan, they accept that we've done the work, that we've verified, and they'll accept the payment plan. But when we're looking at statutory debt options, we, off, we have to send evidence to show that that person is um, what we've put on the, the statement is correct. It's not just the, uh, the breach of the trigger figures, actually the difference between SFS and CFS, uh, administratively, right from the beginning, it's more onerous. Can, it's always difficult to quantify this, but is there any sort of percentage or cost you can put around that? What would you Even know? time. It would probably be time, because at the moment there is um, currently challenges for people gathering the evidence. Um, and people, as Nicola said, when they're coming to us, they're at the lowest point um, being in debt. And the fact that we then need to get them to gather more evidence to be able to get a solution, um, you know, that can delay the process of them getting to that point where they can walk out the door and say, no, I've got something, I'm back into control of my finances. So we're then looking at the standard financial statement where we have to gather even more evidence. That whole process is going to be prolonged to potentially maybe up to three, four weeks extra just for them to gather evidence. Because if you're looking at a monthly uh, financial statement and you're wanting fuel costs for a month, you're going to have to gather evidence for a full month to be able to show, well, that's my actual cost. It's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I Sorry, I Come in and then perhaps to you, Alan. Yeah, Scott. The, uh, thank you. This, this, this is um, actually a subject which is probably more dear to the hearts of the insolvency profession. Um, trigger figures. The trigger figures appear to work for, you know, a, what has clearly been defined as a standard individual. Sadly, we don't deal with standard individuals. We deal with self-employed individuals. We deal with individuals who are on zero-hour contracts. We deal with individuals who who are managing five part-time jobs in any given point in time. The common financial tool, in its, as it stands, doesn't provide for that to work. The standard financial statement, even less so because of the, the, the matters that, that Nicola has just discussed. Um, it's very inflexible. Uh, for, for 20 years, creditors as a group 
accepted what the insolvency profession was assessing as a reasonable amount of income and expenditure and therefore contribution. We've got a lot of experience of doing that. These guys have a lot of experience of doing that. The tool restricts us. And the standard financial statement would appear to be even more restrictive, um, simply because of the, there's, there's less categories, having to lump categories together. Um, I can give you a cost in terms of time for just having to deal with trigger figure breaches. As an example, an individual came to seek insolvency advice from me a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago now, with a view to his personal bankruptcy. Self-employed, worked some months on, some months off, a designer. Um, took us approximately two and a half weeks of toing and froing with the accountant and bankruptcy's office to reach agreement on a zero contribution. Now we knew the minute that gentleman walked in the door that his income and expenditure was such that there was no prospect whatsoever of him being able to provide any contribution towards his debt. It took three weeks effectively, two and a half weeks, toing and froing with the accountant and bankruptcy's office, making the applications, reach of trigger figures, trying to garner evidence from them, trying to get, trying, trying to read from bank statements, and not just, once you get the evidence, you then have to explain the evidence. You know, I've been asked for pay slips from somebody who is self-employed. Self-employed people don't get pay slips. Self-employed people generally issue invoices or are on a self-billing basis. There seems to be a lack of understanding sometimes when dealing with the accountant in bankruptcy over what evidence we are actually able to provide. But at no point are we asked to give our professional opinion and judgment over whether this is correct or not. I can certify an individual's insolvency by signing a bit of paper based on professional knowledge, years of experience, and the evidence that's presented to me. I can make somebody bankrupt, but I can't myself suggest what the contribution should be. Um, it is very, very restrictive to the insolvency profession. The, in terms of hours, Breach of trigger figures, you can be 10, 15 more hours worth of extra work prior to um, being able to, to process and fully proceed with the insolvency application. In the meantime, and from a human perspective, the individual who is suffering problems with debt, who has been often pursued, harassed is perhaps too strong a word, but that's how they feel by creditors, is unable to get the resolution they want and they deserve because of the additional time and effort spent toing and froing with the accountant in bankruptcy over ultimately what amounts to a fiver here or a tenor here. The other major concept or major issue that the insolvency profession faces is that it costs me more to administer £12.74 contribution every month than it does in benefit to the creditors. There's no de minimis. As it stands, the tools are such that whatever number is spat out at the bottom is the number that the contribution order is set at. You know, it's even, even I mean, I've worked for various firms, some charging rates that this committee would find exorbitant, and I would have to agree with that, quite frankly, but some charging much lower rates. Even at the lowest rate of an insolvency practitioner's, a general assistant in a practice, to administer a £12.75 contribution payment on a monthly basis from a bankrupt individual costs us more to do that. There is zero benefit to the creditors. Can and it's at that yeah. point, where is the where is, for want of a better word, the trigger point in that? Where does it become viable financially to collect that payment? Realistically around the fifty pounds a month mark, I would say. From from my perspective as an insolvency practitioner in terms of the income that generates over a four year period. And how many uh, orders are there that would be fifty pounds or over? In, in, in contrast to the ones that are below that? Um, I can only speak for cases that I have a direct involvement with. Um, and a lot of our, a, a lot of the, we, we don't do a massive amount of personal bankruptcy. Um, I would say that there's a disproportionate amount that I see below that £50 a month limit, if we want to call it that, that, that makes it economically viable um, in relation to the overall numbers that, that we're seeing. By disproportionate, um, disproportionate too many. to what? Yeah, there, there's, there's. If, if I'm, if I'm looking at ten bankruptcies, I would suggest that more than half of those are looking at, at contribution amounts which are set following the use of the tools at less than fifty pounds. 
Um, Jackie Bailey wanted to come in at that point, and then we'll come back to Colin Beatty. Yeah, I've, I've got quite a specific question, and it's in relation to the accountant in bankruptcy letter about trigger breaches, and I wonder whether I could put this to Mr McIntosh first. Seems to be a degree of controversy over which financial statement results in the most trigger breaches, and let me just read this section to you that they've sent to us. Owing to significant concerns raised by the money advice sector, the way in which SFS trigger figures were calculated was changed before the figures were uprated for 2018. On the basis of the 2018 trigger figures for both the SFS and CFS, there is a clear fall in cases where trigger figures are breached. Is that correct? Do you know what changes they made? Um, and should we found on their analysis? Uh, from my understanding, what happened was in 2017, the SFS was introduced, uh, comparisons were done, comparative studies were done with Money Advice Scotland in a relatively small amount of cases. The accounting bankruptcy, I did, a, we did a comparative study with about 1,500 cases, and the study was between the SFS 17 and the CFS 7, uh, 17, and uh, I believe that produced, uh, quite, I can't remember the specific amount, but it, it, it produced quite a number of breaches. Uh, what happened was there was a lot of pressure put on, obviously, in relation to the, for the money advice sector by David Hilferty and, uh, primarily about the level of these breaches. And what happened was in SFA, SFS 18, uh, the, the figures were uprated. Uh, some of the figures uh, were uprated by as much as 100%. And I believe the way they did that was because they took the, the obviously, the, the statistics they used, they, they took out the universal credit claimants or benefit claimants, and that therefore raised the average and that allowed the SF18 figures to go up. Unfortunately, they didn't do that for the CFS 18, which is still the figure we're using in Scotland. In actual fact, that uh, actually, at a time of rising living costs, uh, because of the people who obviously are in that income group, we're seeing their incomes in real terms drop, uh, and therefore the amount they were spending drop, as their figures actually were downgraded. Uh, and unfortunately, they didn't, they, although the governance groups for both uh, tools are pretty much the same people, they didn't see fit to uh, obviously maybe apply the same tweaking that they did for the SF18 to the CF18. And so when you make a comparison between the SF18 and the CFS18, uh, it obviously looks like um, that there's less breaches because the SF18 is better. But if you were to make that same comparison, I would argue with the CFS17 before it was downgraded, then I don't know what the outcome would be, but I think that would probably give you a better idea. That's my understanding. So would you go so far as to say there's been a degree of sleight of hand here? Well, I think uh, some people may take the view, and I'm, I'm, I certainly am sympathetic to the view, that uh, this may have been to try and help nudge Scotland into the debt accepting the SF18. That, that's just my view, but I can't say that with any authority. Do any of the other panel know different, or would you concur? I don't know any different. What I can tell you is that, as a result of this, we now have clients who last year <laughs> didn't reach any trigger figures, um, and we could send out their offers, and now we're bringing them back in to review their circumstances, and their incomes haven't changed, but we're having to tell them to spend less, because CFS figures have gone down. And again, we can't disclose how much they have to reduce their living standards by, because we're not allowed to tell them what the trigger figures is. We've just got to tell them, your creditors now expect you to spend less. OK, thank you very much. Um, Colin Beatty. Just coming back to the discussion we were having, um, I'm not hearing much good about SFS from an administrative point of view. Would, would you judge between SFS and CFS which is the fairest to both sides in this? I believe potentially a lot of these tools, and my colleagues may disagree or disagree or agree with me, but I believe potentially they can all provide fair outcomes and they all can provide for both the creditors and the debtors. The key is in how they're applied. Uh, and you know, Because one of the questions that came up last week was, I believe, you know, who are the easiest creditors to deal with? I think consumer creditors, except maybe some of the high-risk lenders, relatively easy to deal with. They, they're pretty trusting. They accept that we are reputable agencies. I'm sure it's the same for the citizens' advice bureaus. I'm sure it's the same for insolvency practitioners. If we tell them stuff, they generally accept that we're following good practice, we're following the FCA's practice, and they accept what we do. Public sector creditors can be a wee bit more difficult, especially because they're in a position where they may you know, with sheriff officers, they may be able to take recovery action, so they can be a wee bit more difficult. 
the biggest problem that we have is really with the credit, it's not a creditor, but the biggest problem we have is actually with accounting and bankruptcy. And one of the reasons why that it's so important that we have to work to this standard, you know, that, that set to us at every single case, you, you were asking what's the cost implications. If we don't get the figures right, if we see our clients put in an application for a minimum asset bankruptcy, which costs eight pound ninety pound application fee, or if we put in an application for a full full administration bankruptcy, which costs two hundred pound, in which our clients struggle to get the money for, if the AIB accept that application and then decide there's further verification required, our client gets a twenty one day letter to produce that evidence, and if they don't produce that evidence, the application falls and they lose their money. And that's why, from a reputational point of view, from an advice point of view, I'm sure my colleagues would all agree, we need to make sure that we're doing double-checking, that we're getting everything correct every single time, because we cannot risk losing that money for these clients that sometimes spend months saving for. So we have to make sure we're right every single time. Um, I, I, I appreciate all that you say, but what I'm looking for is, is a sort of judgment here based on your knowledge and experience of both systems which is the fairest all round? Um, yeah, I think there's there's a difference in the amounts, which is arguable because there's different methodologies. But I would say in terms of principal positions, I think the CFS is fairer, and I've got quite a specific reason for that. In the CFS, we've got another category. And generally what we capture in the other category is things that are lifestyle choices or things that are led by your household circumstances. So you have things like um, vet bills if you've got a pet, You've got um, school meals or meals at work. You've got kids' day out, pocket money, hobbies, leisure, all these sort of things. If somebody exceeds that other category, we then have a conversation about we need to have we need to have a discussion about choices here and what you can afford and what you can't afford. And those kind of things are quite easy to set off against each other. Not always, but they're a bit easier. Some of these things are now moving into housekeeping. Um, so we're now going to be turning around to people and saying well, you maybe can't afford the vet bills or you maybe can't afford the food, we're going to have to make a decision here. And that's not really a route I would, I would want to go down with my clients. I don't think it follows a natural budgeting process. There's a natural idea that you have your housekeeping expenditure, your travel expenditure, phone and connectivity, and then everything else is more choice-based. And we can then have a discussion about what you can afford within that. As I say, that's been taken away in the SFS. And I think, personally, I think it will make it harder to have those budgeting discussions because you'll be asking people to make more, much more difficult choices. Does anyone else have a, a view on this? Um, I, I would certainly agree with that. If pushed, I would say that neither are particularly friendly and helpful, um, certainly from my profession's perspective. But I think the inflex, the, the, there's a greater degree of inflexibility in the standard financial statement, which would undoubtedly make it harder. Um, opinion is I just want something that gives people uh, a decent reasonable living costs so whether that be I've been using the common financial statement since I began money advice back in 2004 and it's, there's never been a big issue with it at all um, but what I'm now seeing is the more onerous kind of administration to actually implement the Scottish financial statement the impact that might have on clients and you know the inflexibility is kind of said by the the other panel members, we need something that gives people a reasonable um, level of standard of life that they can mean that they can pay their debts back as well. Um, and that's what I would want to see in whatever tool that we use. Thank you. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, if we're going to take on board the standard financial statement, my understanding from the evidence this morning is there's less categories and those categories have different expenditure limits. So um, given that costs tend to be different in Scotland, um, in terms of housing costs or heating costs, whatever they happen to be, what's going to be the impact on uh, the individual, the debtor, if we move over to um, the standard financial statement? And putting aside to one thing, that the point that Jackie Bailey raised regarding you know, whether we're comparing like with like in terms of the two systems, what would the impact be in the ordinary individual? Top of my head, I don't think... In, what you're talking about, the heating and housing costs would come under the fixed category, so mm -hmm. there's not limits on those. Um, so they wouldn't be particularly impacted by that. Similarly, we've got a lot of rural populations yeah, yeah. and petrols moved, so yeah. the things that are left over are things like um, food, phone and broadband. So I guess the big one I could maybe think 
would be an issue is maybe for rural communities the cost of broadband could be an issue but again if they're breaching trigger figures it's up to the person that receives that to take our justification for why they're breaching that trigger figure and understand it and I would hope um, that if we were dealing with accounting and bankruptcy and there was extra cost because it, they're based in Scotland they would understand them but as I say we would still have to provide evidence whenever there's a breach. Right. I mean, I think uh, one of the things is it's obviously, uh, you know, it's hard to say because obviously it's, it's dependent on every single case, you know, so to make generalisations is difficult. However, I think it was recognised by the Scottish Government when the Brown Fort brought forward their recent changes to the debt arrangement, uh, debt arrangement scheme that uh, was passed for this committee, I believe, in September. Uh, they've now made provisions, so and it came in the 29th of October, where debtors who are now uh, in the debt arrangement scheme do not need to give their full disposable income over to the creditors. And I think that's maybe a recognition of uh, the restricted nature of living on these budgets uh, over any period of time. Uh, and they felt in, in relation to the debt arrangement scheme that people shouldn't be that restricted like that, which is, I think it's understandable. I supported that. Uh, however, I think they've got to bear in mind that, 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 that there's debtors who are in bankruptcies and debtors in trustees who also may continue, to, who will, don't have that ability to not offer everything, so they will still continue to live with these restricted budgets. If the budgets become tighter going forward, then obviously it's going to make it harder. There's more chances of default. There's more chances of people missing payments, which I'm sure has consequences for insolvency practitioners. Uh, it has problems for money advisors. Uh, if, if trustees fail, uh, well, a sequestration can never really fail, but if a trustee fails, the clients basically get their debt back, and then they come back to us, and we spend a lot of time dealing with us uh, where people have been in a solution that doesn't work, it fails, they come back to us, we need to start from scratch again. Um, and so you know, it means that clients didn't get their debts resolved within the four years, it's maybe going to take six years or eight years. So I think it's not going to be a good thing if it, if it doesn't, uh, if it's, it's going to put people on a more restricted budget. And ju just in general terms, do, you know, does either uh, system, whether it's a, the common financial statement or the standard financial statement, do either provide a reasonable standard of living for the person that's trying to make those repayments? I think that's subjective, because I think it depends on what you consider to be a reasonable standard of living. Uh, I don't think the majority... I think, you know, we sometimes have clients who live in poverty, but that's not because of these common financial statements. Uh, it's because they maybe they've got very low incomes. In terms of, you know, if we're people... And the majority of the clients that uh, we see in Inverclyde uh, of the majority of the clients at my money advisors and see member client breaching the trigger figures is not really the big issue. It's about verification because the majority of my clients never even get near the trigger figures because they're on universal credit, etc. Um, so, but whether people, you know, it depends on what you have a as, as, as you have as a reasonable standard of living. I put in, a sub in my submission a sort of definition of it, which uh, is one definition. Uh, I won't read it out because it takes quite a long time. But I generally speaking think a reasonable standard of living is to live, you know, be, uh, be able to go to work, live in a warm house, have various different types of clothing. You know, you sometimes go to my, my kids' schools and you see children wearing totally inappropriate clothing for the winter and you can obviously see that's affecting maybe low incomes and so these are the sort of things that I would associate being able to have some social time going out having a meal it, it really depends on what your your views are of what, what constitutes a reasonable standard of living but I would hope that we've moved on for sort of Victorian times so uh, these are the sort of things I would see as a reasonable standard of living whether these allow this I think it really depends on a case-to-case -case basis but it does have the potential not to allow it in some cases yeah, I guess I would say no. <laughs> um, and I would say no for a couple of reasons. I mean, mainly, well, for, for one reason, that's not what these tools are based on. <laughs> these tools are based to make sure you have a lifestyle that base, is based on the average standard of living of those in the lowest <laughs> incomes. So we don't even start out from trying to give people a reasonable standard of living. So we're not measuring that because that's not what the tools are devised to do. Um, but there's two reasons that I think they they definitely don't. Um, one is there's a lot of credit given to the CFT for, for bringing in a savings provision, which we didn't have before. However, that savings provision is 10% of your disposable income to a maximum of £20. So you only get £20 a month to put away if you already have a disposable income of £200. If you've got less than £100 a month, you're getting less than a tenner a month to save. That's nothing. And to be honest, it's very unlikely that clients will be saving that. So if there's an unexpected school trip, if the washing machine breaks down, they don't have the money to deal with these things. So for me, that's not an adequate standard of living if we're not allowing people enough money 
to be able to just deal with an emergency or just an, an extra birthday or anything like that. The other thing is in terms of the Scot Scottish Government's work on child poverty, you already talk about material deprivation. You already talk about the need to be able to have a tenner a week. but well, we don't allow that in the financial tool. We don't, we don't turn around and say that the adult must have something to spend on themselves every week. So the measures that you're already discussing in terms of poverty, these tools would fail on for me. So, so what changes would we, would, should we be making to the system in order to reflect the things that you've just suggested? I think if you want a tool that mm -hmm. gives people a reasonable standard mm -hmm. of living, then that's what you have to start out from, is what is a reasonable standard of living? What do we give people? And then that, what's left over goes towards their debt. Um, but if that's not what you want, if what you want is people to live on an, the average standard of someone on a lower income, then these are the tools to go ahead with. But as I say, you, you can't kind of retrofit these tools to become something that's going to give you an average standard of living because it's, or a reasonable standard of living because that's not what they're designed to do. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Could I just add, um, I think in that respect it's absolutely correct and where, there's a, where, where we see a huge skew is that in terms of standard of living that if you're quite a wealthy individual with a large house and a huge mortgage, that's okay. You know, I've got, I've got bankrupts who were paying thousands of pounds a month on a mortgage. Now, they can choose not to have to do that if they see fit. But because the mortgage cost doesn't have any trigger figure, doesn't have any bearing on the rest of it, you know, that, that, that's okay. You know, it's, it's quite all right. And in, in, in some, to some degree, it almost favours, the current system almost favours the more well-off, notwithstanding that they would perhaps expect a higher general standard of living with their expenses. But if they choose to channel a huge amount of their disposable income, or their income, sorry, into housing costs, into an expensive mortgage or very expensive rent. They're not penalised for that. Now, if I'm looking at it from a creditor perspective, because fundamentally, once I'm appointed, my clients are the creditors. My job is to get money back for the creditors, um, whilst still obviously having a duty of care to the, the, the insolvent individual's well-being, financial well-being, often mental well-being, but that's something we all have just to deal with. Um, you know, it, it's from a creditor perspective, I generally don't see a standard of living problem. And often I've actually, you know, you're looking at having, having calculated a, let's say there's a, a creditor appointment, a more hostile bankruptcy appointment, where the debtor is clearly clever enough to beat the system. That, that's a scenario where we have no scope for any adjustments or to, 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 to attack that potentially. You know, there's nothing more distressing for a creditor who's owed thousands and thousands of pounds than seeing the bankrupt living in a five million pound house or a million pound house, still driving the nice car, um, which is on higher purchase, which is a necessary expenditure to get to and from whatever self-employed or you know, trust employed job they may have. So there is a great disparity between the less well-off in society and those who are somehow able to, to beat the system or those who have been declared bankrupt or who wish to declare themselves bankrupt, but who are, have come from a much a greater position of wealth to begin with, there's no, you know, there's no, op there, there is a, there's no option box in this, in the tool. And I think for me, what would help fix that is you run through the common financial tool, you stick in all the information, and there, there, there should be a, a discretionary box for those of us with the expertise to be able to make that judgment call, not the accountant in bankruptcy. You know, if we have to use the tools, and I'm still going to say we would rather not, our profession would rather see um, an assessed amount of fair living standard, which takes you back to, obviously, Nicola's comment of what is the fair living standard. And we, um, as a profession, certainly in Scotland, would prefer to see total of income deduct a fixed amount, depending on circumstances, for, 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 for general living expenses, and then apply a percentage to whatever's left. Consistency across the board, um, but taking account of the individual's circumstances, the individual circumstances of each and every debtor, rather than applying a one fix to all potential problems. Um, but we don't have that option box. We don't have that discretionary box. We don't have that ten pounds, you know, twenty pounds a week savings box. Um, you know, we don't have that. What if something does go wrong? Because things go wrong all the time. You know, things. You know, sometimes your fridge blows up for no reason. It's happened to me the other day. You know, it's just um, you, you can't you, know, you, you can't just pigeonhole everything into a set of, of 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 numbers and tools, and one size does not fit all. Absolutely not. 
And would that address a lot of the issues you've raised about um, those that are better off being able to sort of avoid the system and not make the payments they should be making? I think if you change, if, if you if you change, if we move away from the common financial tool as it is, yes, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Because if the debtor wants to stay in the house that costs them £3,000 a month for their mortgage or their rent, then they're going to have to figure out a way to do that that's not 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 going to be a cost to the creditors, whereas currently it is. Yeah, thanks so much. I suppose, uh, though, on that, that last point, um, if you had a discretionary box where you could just decide, um, who would the creditor or debtor then have a right to appeal to? The creditor would... Against your decision if you're going to exercise a discretion. I think on that, on that basis, you would, you would apply the same rules that creditors have a right to appeal against trustees' remuneration um, or any action of the trustee. Creditors have the ability to, to you know, to, to insist that the trustee convenes a meeting of creditors. They can be represented at that meeting. They can seek to be elected as a commissioner in place of the accountant in bankruptcy to assume a greater control and have a greater... Um, understanding of the process on a more daily basis. There's, there's nothing to stop um, regulations being introduced to give creditors the opportunity to object to that. The, the, those objection processes are in place as it stands. So what I'm saying is, is the accountant in bankruptcy the right person to make that judgment call on what's right and what's wrong in those circumstances? Right. Um, just to move on to another um, question, uh, and this is, if one assumes that the, the SFS were to be brought in, um, would you have concern about how that would develop as it pro progresses? I mean, I think Alan accepted there'd be some benefits in having a UK-wide system. Um, is there any concern or do you think it would be helpful to have a UK-wide system in terms of how that develops going forward rather than a, a separate Scottish system, CFS system? Obviously, um, yeah, I, I have raised my concerns. Um, I have acknowledged that there could be benefits to a UK system. I don't think it needs to be, but I have raised my concerns. I think there's an issue about accountability here. I think there's an issue about transparency, about the public visibility of these figures. But it's also, I think, that what happens is, is if these regulations were passed, um, then obviously, the, if, if, and I believe they're currently working on a review of the CF, SFS figures, so even if we were to discuss the figures, which obviously we can't do publicly, but if we, even if we were to discuss the figures that uh, currently apply just now, the reality is they're not going to be the figures that are introduced on April 2019 because there's a currently a review going on. Uh, we, but, you know, one of my concerns is if, if we had a similar situation to what we had with the CFS 18, where the figures go down, which seems to be nonsensical, but it's completely logical if you look at the methodology that's been used to calculate those figures. Uh, there's no, there's no real accountability to that. You know, we, we, it's just a case that we just need to sort of accept them. It doesn't it, un, uh, to give another example. Currently, I believe the accounting bankruptcy are, are planning to lay figures in front of this committee and new regulations in relation to the bank arrestment and the earnings arrestment amounts because they're upgraded every three years. But they do have to come in front of this committee. This committee does have to get to them, look at them. Uh, if this committee passes these regulations, then we pretty much have to accept that what this governance body, how they calculate those figures, we use that methodology, whether they choose to tweak them or not tweak them. Uh, and we, we just have to accept them as a sector. They're, they're not going to come back in front of this committee. There's not going to be any scrutiny of them. Uh, and that, that's a concern to me because obviously I think this is something within the, the Parliament's uh, authority. And, you know, just my personal view is that I, I, I do value that I do, I do believe that the Parliament should be scrutinising these figures. And if we sign off on these figures, then this can change, like it did with the CFS 18, where it just goes down. It, and as Nicholas uh, raised the concerns, uh, the problems that's created for some of her clients, and it never came back to this committee. And elected members never got to see the figures. You weren't aware that it happened because we can't share the figures. So that, that's my general concern. So, uh, I mean, the, 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 I suppose my question is uh, directed specifically to if we had a UK-wide system as opposed to a separate Scottish system in terms of the CFS, um, is that going to make any difference in terms of input into how the systems run 
or the ability to influence it. I mean, I think your point is that this parliament should be in a position to um, scrutinise, as it were, as this committee is doing with these draft uh, regulations. Uh, and is that a concern that wouldn't be the case if, if we went to this, this UK-wide SFS system? I believe, that is, uh, yeah, I believe yeah. that's my concern, that we would effectively, unless these regulations were brought back in, and the reason they're brought in at the moment is only because the CFA, CFS has been discontinued in April, and that's why they're here. Uh, I think if they pass, they, they won't be back for quite a considerable time. But maybe some of my other colleagues may want to add to that point. Scott Milne, I think you wanted to come I, I, th I think um, Scotland is a bit different. You know, We are our own country. It's why we're all sitting here in the first place. And it would be, to me, a total loss of control. Um, yeah, I think the, as a local authority, we always participate quite a lot in consultations that come out from the IB about Scottish legislation, because um, obviously it impacts on us quite a lot. The concern for us if we go to SFS is the Scottish voices will be diluted, and we do have consequentials from the decisions that are made about the SFS on the CFT. Um, and how the AIB then go and administer that for statutory solutions. When it's only Scottish um, advice agencies that are talking about that, we're pretty much united with one voice. It's not of concern to our colleagues in England and Wales because they don't have the same products and they don't have the same processes. So my concern would be that our voice just might not matter as much in those discussions and we might not find that we can influence it as heavily. I suppose the, the counter to that is the um, suggestion that moving to a, a UK-wide system means that creditors would be operating the same, applying the same rules and principles to things and be able to understand what's happening in Scotland. Do you see that as a, a counter-argument at all? Not really. As I say, we never have an issue using the CFS and the regulations for creditors tells them to use the CFS, not the SFS at this point. Right. Um, Go to that. <coughs> yeah, sorry. Quickly, I think... I think far too much importance is placed or far too much concern has been given to the, the concerns of creditors. Um, creditors don't care, genuinely. Well, <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of what system is used, they just need to know that it's coming from somebody who is, who, who is, who is a regulated or authorised person to tell them. Yes, I think, I think the suggestion, in fairness to the, the paraphrase I was using, was that debtors would benefit because creditors would know where they're at as well as debtors. So I suspect debtors don't care as long as they're being treated fairly and have a, a proper system they can rely upon in, in the same yeah. sense. Right, um, a, a brief follow-up from Willie Coffey before we come to Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, convener. Uh, uh, somebody new to, to this committee and this subject, uh, absolutely fascinating to read and listen to your contributions, given with such passion, I should say, too. But I just wanted to ask, uh, Alan, wh where, does the, where does the accountability trail end up then, if it's not here? And you, you mentioned it in the tail end of your paper that if Scotland adopts this and it produces these unexpected results, we just can't turn it off? Does that mean we're stuck with it? Well, if more? I can give you an example to that, uh, I believe what happened is Payplan, which is a private company, but they're, they're a free provider of uh, debt solutions for the whole of the UK. They're one of the largest providers of debt solutions for the whole UK. When the SFS 17 was brought in, in April 2017, what actually happened is they adopted it, I believe. Uh, I believe they trialled it for a few months, and then my understanding is that they stopped using it because they felt it produced... Uh, over generous results in favour of the debtor, uh, and I then believe that they, they stopped using it for almost over a year. We are not going to be able to do that. Once these regulations are passed, we don't get to sort of go cancel. You know, we, we've got them, whether we like them or not, whether it works or not, they're staying. The, down in England, in Wales, Northern Ireland, they've got the option because it's voluntary, they can turn it off and say, we're actually not using this at the moment until we get systems fixed or we do more training for the staff. We don't get that option. Uh, so the, 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 my, my big concern is, once this is passed, uh, you know, and, and, and I think uh, it really, and rather than Scotland is going to join the rest of the UK in using these figures, I actually think what's happening is Scotland has basically been used as the one that's going to push them into the rest of the UK because they will be accepted and used uniformly across the whole of Scotland if these regulations are passed. Uh, and that's not actually happened. I think they've been widely used across the UK, but they've not been uh, uniformly adopted. Scotland, if we turn this into legislation, that they become basically uniform. And I do have concerns about accountability because, for example, I believe uh, the gentleman for the Money Advice Service last week spoke about... Um, he spoke about, you know, the comparative studies that were done with the uh, Joseph Rowntree minimum income figures and they weren't as bad, etc. 
I'm on the Common Financial Tool Working Group, or I was, um, I was on the Common Financial Tool Working Group. I've never seen that report because it doesn't get circulated. Uh, people will say Money Advice Scotland sits on that committee, Citizens Advice Scotland commits on, sits on that governance body, Accounting, ba uh, Accounting Bankruptcy sits on that governance body, Scotland has been represented on that body. We also sat in the Money Advice Scotland Management Committee, uh, as it does Nicola. I sat on the Money Advice Scotland Social Policy Committee. I did not see that report. Uh, I did not see it as a member of the Common Financial Working Group. I did not see it as part of the, the, the Money for Scotland Social Policy Committee. I also requested that the Common Financial Tool Working Group, that a study be done into the, the public visibility, the trigger figures. That was commissioned months and months went by. I eventually asked them what happened to that report. They said to me it was done. I said, can we not see it? They basically said it's only been shared within the governance group of the SFS. Again, as a Common Financial Tool Working Group member, I did not get to see it as a Money for Scotland uh, committee member and social policy committee uh, member, I did not get to see it. So although Scotland has been represented uh, you know, by certain organisations, I believe these organisations have been restricted in terms of who they can circulate information to. So what sort of voice do we really have? Right, we'll move to Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, just, just a few points. I mean, it's true, is it not, that the vast majority of debtors don't enter into statutory solutions they reach. Um, can you quantify that, roughly? Not off the top of my head. I could come back to the committee. I can run a report to tell you what percentage are in statutory solutions over the last year. I can come back to the committee with that. That might be quite helpful. Thanks very much. Um, and Alan, I think you were talking about earlier about there's no role for Parliament in scrutiny of the actual figures. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there, there, there isn't. There, there isn't now and there never has been. I just wanted to clarify that nothing's mm -hmm. changing in that regard. No. You, you were indicating that you would like that to be the case. Would that actually be possible within the current legislative regime? I don't believe it would be because, it, well, I, I believe, well, it depends. I mean, I believe the problem is, is that to access these, these figures, you need to have a licence agreement. Uh, so, for example, I've got a licence agreement. Well, I've not got a licence agreement. My employer, Inverclyde Council, has a licence agreement with the Money Advice Trust and the Money Advice Service in relation to the Common Financial Statement and the Standard Financial Statement. As part of that licence agreement, we cannot publicly disclose those figures to clients or anywhere else. We can't put them on our website. So, I guess... That if the, I don't know, but if obviously this Parliament wanted to see them, I guess they would need to be given to this Parliament in confidential, on a confidential base, because otherwise if they went on your website, then I take it they then would become public information. So um, I, I, I have questions about how, how, how much can you scrutinise these figures? I mean, because it's quite clear that if we can't share them, we can't allow them to get into the public arena, because otherwise we'd in breach of our, uh, our, our licence agreements. OK, I'm going to come on to that in just a minute. But... Yeah, Another question, I mean, you say the common financial statement it's proposed will not be used beyond April next year. Yeah. The regulations intend to replace it. Um, but there's a question regarding the, the administration and the updating and the governance of both the common financial statement and the standard financial statement. If, if these regulations are not passed, what happens to the common financial statement through 2019-20? We will need to... Uh resolve that problem because obviously they will need to be upgraded um, and the information the raw data that's used to create them is obviously public available uh, I don't know if someone could be or as a Scottish government department I believe in the last meeting people are saying that maybe certain sections of the Scottish government could take on that role whether it's something you'd pass to maybe an academic or pay for an academic organisation like a university you know, department to do it but obviously somebody would have to take on the responsibility of upgrading these figures uh, and possibly tweaking them because uh, obviously somebody will have to do that. Otherwise, we're going to have figures that are basically frozen in time and the cost of living is going to be continue to increase. But if you did contract that to a university or government did it in-house, then there'd still have to be the same licensing regime around using them potentially? No, because then it would, it would be our licence effectively because, you know, we, we, we would just be called okay. something else and we'd just, it would be us that would issue those figures and the Scottish Government would be able to give those figures. I mean, once, I mean, I, I, it was probably about, uh, pro, uh, it was probably about, um, sort of, you know, I, I was probably being a bit devilish, but, you know, I did actually put a freedom of information request into the accounting and bankruptcy when they introduced them in 2015 and says, can I get the... the 
the, the common financial statement trigger tickles. I already had them, but I just wanted to see if they were given them through the Freedom of Information request. They refused on the basis of that they were bound with the licence agreements. I suppose if the Scottish Government takes on that role, they would have to disclose them under Freedom of Information rules. OK, so that moves on to the substantive point. I mean, Nicola, you were talking earlier about the importance of trust in the system with your clients. I mean, um, and, and the licence at the moment means that these cannot be shared. And as I understand it, um, the argument for that is to provide some comfort to creditors that debtors can't game the system by that, putting the argument it's made for that. Um, do you think these figures should be made public? Oh, I would say definitely yes. I don't understand it myself. I work in an integrated advice team. We do a lot of different types of advice. My colleagues that work in welfare rights can sit down with a client with a disability and show them the scoring system for PIP. They don't have to worry that that client is going to turn around and say, oh, I've got that, I've got that, I've got that, and try and game the system. My clients that work in housing can explain the allocations policy, how points are awarded. Again, they don't worry about that client pretending and gaming the system. So I don't understand why have, they have this deep mistrust of people that are in debt. Most of the people that come to see us are not reckless, they're not feckless, they've not got into debt because they've badly behaved or been dishonest. Something has happened in their life. They've become ill, they've had a relationship breakdown, they've lost their job. They were living within their means, they were doing everything right and they thought they could manage their debt and something happened they didn't expect. And because of that, I've, I've got to go on this level of mistrust, which doesn't feel right, as I say. Again, when we were having that conversation, I don't think that my colleagues in other advice, uh, the other advice sectors understand the level of information that we're taking from people. We're asking them for the bank details. We're asking them for all the details of health of everybody in that house. We're asking them about their background and what happened to them. We're asking them to explain how they go about their lives, how do you pay your bills, what do you spend it on. Give me your bank statement so I can go through it and itemise everything. That's not a comfortable position to be in. And we have to do a lot of work to build that trust and to release the shame from the person because the other thing that money advice clients have in common when they come in is they blame themselves. Regardless of the fact that, as I say, for most people it's been a change of circumstances or just living on a very, very low income where you don't have enough money to get your essentials. They come in blaming themselves. Quite commonly, I'm sure my colleagues will tell you, they missed the first appointment, they missed the second appointment, they missed the third appointment because their bottle goes. And most people would say, well, we're going to stop dealing with you because you've abused the terms of the system. We tend not to do that because we understand that debt clients need a couple of times to come back to you. And the same goes when it comes to the evidence gathering. These people, a lot of the time, aren't opening their mail. <laughs> and then we've got to say to them, right, here's a big list of things. You've got to get it within 21 days or it's going to cost you 90 quid, 200 quid. Um, but as I say, in terms of the releasing the figures, I think it's, it's I think it's a shocking way to treat people who have done nothing wrong. They've done everything right. We don't tell people not to take on credit. We tell people credit's a good thing, but as soon as they struggle to pay it, we stop trusting them. It's the way that it seems. Okay, thanks. That's very helpful. Um, I mean, coming out of the evidence last week was the suggestion that the existing system, Common Financial Statement, um, needs some review. The, the current system needs review. In fact, Scott, you were actually advocating a very different system. Um, and I think that was also advocated, as I recall, from the Institute of Chartered Accountants. I think uh, we're saying that as well. I mean, instead of changing the basis on which we assess people's ability to pay off their debts, should we be undertaking a rather more fundamental review about how that works and how that's done before we get to which tool we should be using. Is there is there some value in that or or do we not really need to do that? I would say there's a lot of value in that and I would say that one of the biggest pieces that's missing is nobody speaking to the debtors about what it's like to live within these trigger figures. We sign them off, we send them away, even for ourselves we see them every six months. If they're in an informal payment arrangement, we would bring them in every six months, see how things are going, make sure they're managing things okay, see if there's any other support that they need, and confirm to the creditors whether their circumstances have changed or not. That's a duty on us because of the creditors. Um, but that discussion's half an hour. It's not research. It's anecdotal. I think to know how people are actually managing and whether people are sticking to this, because, again, I think my colleagues would probably agree, we all have clients that, with the best will in the world, go out, going to stick to these figures with a plan, and the next time we see them, they've had to take out another loan, they've had to do this, they've had to do that, they've missed payments. Well, rather than us just taking an approach which says, right, how do we fix this? 
I think if somebody was actually looking at why that's happening and whether there's a, an issue with sustainability within the system, um, and getting the debtor's perspective is key, I think, on that. Could I just add, I, th I think fundamentally from our profession, we believe that a different solution or a different method of calculation for a statutory debt solution would, would be viable to an informal debt solution. In an informal debt solution, the individual debtors are doing the best to pay off their creditors. In a statutory debt solution, if you exclude a DAS from that debt arrangement scheme, it, it's, it's, it's a... Sorry, if you exclude what? If you exclude a DAS debt arrangement scheme. Oh, right, um, sorry. Yeah, uh, which provides for effectively repayment in full of the debt over a period of time. If you're looking at the other the statutory solutions, a trustee to a bankruptcy in Scotland, that's a debt forgiveness tool. The creditor's not going to get 100 pence in the pound, so the calculation you're doing is for a different purpose, effectively. Um, and we believe, and certainly I believe personally, but my profession, from those I've spoken to, believe that, that there is absolute scope for a different system. We don't, you know, trigger figures, I, I, I still, have, I find it very bizarre that trigger figures are, cannot be discussed. Um, I'm not party to any agency agreement or license agreement to use the tools. I'm an insolvency practitioner. I have to use the tools. The statute requires I do that. Um, so I've not signed up to using them. I just have no choice but to use them effectively. Um, John, on that, does that, if you haven't signed a license, does that mean you're not bound by the confidentiality agreement? We we <laughs> adhere we adhere to it. We, we don't we don't tell debtors what the trigger figures are. But you're you're in but in law in law you're free to if you wish to. Um, I couldn't answer that question just now because I haven't actually given it the consideration. Okay. To see if I have, we've we've just adopted so I've adopted as far as I'm aware a similar approach to to all the the, the kind of pre statutory insolvency um, regime. Um, advice centres and, 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 and different different agencies who, who deal with this. But it doesn't take much for a debtor to work out what the trigger figures are. I spend £500 a week on shopping. You can't. Sorry, it's too much. How about 350 then? Yep, that works. <laughs> Do you know? It's not, it's not difficult for somebody with a little bit of intelligence to be able to calculate in their own head what the trigger figures are. We don't sit down with a debtor and say, right, I want all your receipts, I want your shopping bills, I want all of this. We sit down and say, well, what do you spend? You know, if, if I'm appointed on a creditor, a court appointment of, by a creditor, I send a, a document to the debtor. Why? Well, I also say, please come and see me. That says, fill out this income and expenditure form. We then plug that into the common financial tool, and if it breaches trigger figures, we have to disallow certain expenditures. Then um, we're looking, we're, and, and, and we we are looking at in those circumstances, obtaining the evidence after the event, not prior to the event. So a debtor says to me, I spend you know, 500 pounds a month on shopping. Plug the numbers in, it either accepts it or it doesn't. Um, and it doesn't take a huge amount for someone to work out what the trigger figures are and where they, you know, what, what within a very close range. Um, I kind of understand that there is a concern that creditors would be worried that our professions are working with debtors to try and pay them the minimum amount or nothing at all. Um, as I've said, though, in a statutory debt process, creditors have rights and you know, they have rights to challenge um, all of that. They have rights to question us. They have rights to be heard. Um, we are presenting them with a scenario, and as I say, more often than not, they accept that. But there's no—I don't believe there's a need for. It's back to this one tool. Certainly, does not fit all scenarios. Um, you know, you're, you're being asked to to use a sim the same tool. For somebody who, is, as you've said, maybe has a marriage breakdown, runs into financial difficulty, wants to avoid a bankruptcy, doesn't want to get involved in a trust deed, doesn't want to be tied to a debt arrangement scheme for X amount of years, um, just wants to sort their problems out. That's a very, very different animal to somebody who is made bankrupt by HMRC for not paying their taxes. Or somebody who comes to me and says, Scott, I really can't deal with this. You know, my business has gone bust. I've got a huge personal guarantee to a bank. Please help me. Help me deal with this. Those are completely different um, animals. They're, they're opposite ends of the spectrum. But yet, we're all supposed to use the same process to decide what the outcome is. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe just add to that again. Can I, stealing from Alan and being a bit devilish, I guess. The concern about creditors that will max out 
trigger figures. I can understand maybe with the other category, as I see, it's a bit lifestyle changes and things. But if that is based on the lowest quintile incomes and average standard of living, why are we so worried that people are going to adhere to that level of standard of living? Why do we want to make sure that they don't possibly get there? Um, I, I have a bit of an issue with that as well. I don't think, I've never seen a money advisor go about their business by saying, that's what you put there because I've worked it out, that's what you'll get to spend. As I say, there would be no point because we can't then do the budgeting work that's so key to what we do and it's not going to be sustainable. But if people are at those limits, they're not having a luxurious life. We've already established that. So why, why are creditors going to be so worried about it, I guess, is my concern. So, uh, I think we're, we're now coming up for um, running out of time. In fact, we've, we've run over our intended time. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if um, all of you think there should be a review, perhaps if you could write into the committee and indicate what areas such a review could cover and also perhaps set out your specific comments on how a better system would operate, because I think it's probably commonly accepted that uh, it's easy to criticise, you know, but often it's more difficult to see how to actually build something better. So if, if you have thoughts like that you'd like to submit to the committee, then we would welcome those. Uh, Andy Whiteman? A brief follow-up. It'd be useful if you did that quite quickly, because we're taking evidence from the Minister next week. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so you may not be able to write a 200-page thesis, but um, if you did have uh, thoughts that you could provide to us quickly, um, that that would could potentially be very useful to the committee. So thank you very much for coming in today. I'll now suspend the session, move into private session.